Do you remember the Shire, Mr. Frodo? It'll be spring soon. The orchards will be in blossom, and the birds will be nesting in the hazel thicket, and they'll be sowing the summer barley in the lower fields, and eating the first of strawberries and cream. Do you remember the taste of strawberries? No, Sam. I can't recall the taste of food, nor the sound of water or the touch of grass. I'm naked, in the dark. There's nothing. No veil between me and the wheel of fire. I can see him with my waking eyes. Then let us be rid of it, once and for all. Come on, Mr. Frodo. I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you. One of the many scenes in Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings, adapted to accommodate for the big screen, and in combination with a musical score from Howard Shaw and a dedication from the actors, it is arguably more poignant and impactful than even some segments in the books themselves, in my opinion. It may seem contradictory to say, but I believe this adapted scene, along with many others, helps to express the messages and beliefs of Tolkien better than even the professor himself could. In life, it is clear that Tolkien held certain things in higher regard than others. He was very fond of the natural world, and through reading The Lord of the Rings, his love and gratitude towards it can be seen expressed in the places and environments that he admires. The Shire for its simplicity, and the Domain of Elves for its extraordinary complexity and majesty. The importance and need to preserve these places, and in doing so, all things good, is consistently touched upon again and again throughout the quest for the ring, even more so when faced with the harshness of mass industry. Saruman, a powerful being with a once strong spirit, faced his retribution when he dismissed the importance of the natural world, using it for his war effort of metal and fire. In doing so, he turned from being one who had everything to a formless ghost patrolling the wind. There was an admiration from Tolkien, however, when describing Sauron's armies. They are terrible, yes, but great and terrible. Industry as a force indeed is remarkable, but mass industry for the sole purpose of power and ownership is foolhardy and irresponsible. These themes of contrasting industry with the natural world appear consistently throughout the books and are expressed and presented with elegance and professionalism in the films. From the marvellous designs of the sets to the intricate details on the costumes, Peter Jackson's trilogy cements the audience in the world that Tolkien envisioned. In 1954, when the book was first published, humanity was going through a bit of a shift. Dictators around the world were being confronted and defeated. Tensions were still high between the West and the East, but new political movements were starting and breakthroughs in the arts and sciences were flowering across the world. Now more than ever, humans as a species needed to work together and it was evident that when we did, we flourished. This theme of camaraderie when faced against evil is constant in Tolkien's works. There is nothing one can do that is more noble than to sacrifice your needs for the greater needs of others, to work for something that is bigger than yourself. Everybody in the fellowship sacrifice something, whether it be their life, their pride, or their own personal needs but ultimately, they all gain something in the end. Freedom and respect, to name a few. Just acting to fulfill your own needs will result in failure in one way or another. When in the presence of the ring, the needs of others are overlooked, shadowed by the avaricious thoughts of the individual. Smeagol was prepared to murder his own cousin and close friend Deagle to simply hold it. Boromir, one of the most admired men in Gondor, almost stole the ring from Frodo, clouded by its lies of grandeur. The only beings that don't seem to be heavily affected by its power are the Shire folk, possibly hinting at how when one is content, one has no need for power, for to be truly powerful is to not want, but simply to be.
It seems as if we are just resting on the precipice, and one more step forward is the annihilation of Numenor. Amazon has changed the world, for better or worse, the world will not be the same again. The ease and speed of everyday life that a majority of people experience would make the ancient Greeks bow down and weep. We have the power of gods to communicate cross-country in an instant and to heal most wounds and illnesses. The rise of Amazon and the almighty Lord Bezos is not too dissimilar to Sauron's pretense of Anatar, Lord of Gifts, who single-handedly shattered the greatest human civilization to ever live on Middle-earth. By tempting them with gifts and knowledge, they forsook their ways of life and adopted new, sour ideals, until eventually they were all but a few swallowed up by the ocean. All in all, I just fear that the new Rings of Power show will fail to express the messages that Tolkien intended to express. I fear that adapting material from the 1950s into the world of today is a recipe for disaster. I don't believe that one of the largest and most successful mass market companies in the world, who operate at the turning of the tides as far as the climate is concerned, can create a show for an individualistic audience and feasibly keep Tolkien's ideals at heart. Ironically, ideals that are more important now than ever before. What can we do in the end? We've got the Shire. Maybe we should go. The fires of Isengard will spread. And the woods of Tukbro and Buckland will burn. And... And all that was once green and good in this world will be gone. There won't 